Everything we do has got a deep element of groove and swing to it. <laughs> My name is Sherry Miracle, and I'm a jazz drummer, composer, and a band leader. When I started, uh, first started playing music in fourth grade, I guess I was about age 11. I was in concert band, there wasn't really any other opportunities. And that, of course, in, in middle school, I remember morphing into kind of having an interest for the drum set. And actually, when I was 11 is when my life changed, when I went to see Buddy Rich and his Killer Force Orchestra at the Forum in Binghamton, New York. I'd never heard jazz in my life. And that band hit and I got every hair on my body stood up on end and I flipped out and I was on the edge of my seat and, it, and I ran home and I said, Mom, Mom, <laughs> I heard this music, it's jazz and it's a big band and this drummer's amazing and I have to play drums and I have to be in a big band. And she said, oh sure, pat pat on the head. Like she didn't know what I was talking about. That's exactly what I've always wanted to do since that moment. And I'm still trying to do that. <laughs> By the time I got into into high school, of course, there was a, a jazz ensemble, and at first I was too, a little bit too nervous or intimidated to audition for it because, you know, no uh, young women or girls were ever in the band before. And again, teacher said to me, and I think he literally said something to me when I was expressing my, but there's no, no girl has ever played the drums before. And he's like, what are, what are you, stupid? Something to that effect. <laughs> Go on, audition, what are you, crazy? So I just, I, I did, and then of course that was that, in that high school, like full steam ahead, like this is what I'm doing. So when I finished undergrad school, all I wanted to do was go to New York and play jazz. I got into NYU in grad school. Much to my, oh my gosh, great excitement, Mel Lewis was on the jazz faculty. I got to study with Mel Lewis. Sometimes my lesson would, literally, I remember playing the third set at the Vanguard with his band, Village Vanguard. 21, scared out of my mind. I'm like, this can't be a drum lesson. But you didn't, did you have to teach me things first and then stick me in that situation? But that was remarkable. And that Mel was in the audience and he'd be, he'd be literally, the, I mean, they don't do three sets anymore, but he would be out there, play louder, go to this symbol. He'd be telling me directions and I was like, oh my God, these, I hope these paying people are drunk. <laughs> to, hear, to hear somebody getting schooled in the art of big band drumming. And then we stayed fr friends until he um, sadly passed away. He was, he's a huge influence on me and all of my, uh, uh, everything artistically, musically, jazz-wise and swing-wise had have some deep roots in my heart and soul is, you know, tightly wound up with Mel Lewis. All of us think about these real pivotal moments in our life. May of 1990, I was a pickup, just the drummer for an event, the 75th anniversary of the Schubert Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. So I'm just there hired as the drummer. In came this great, amazing dancer named Maurice Hines and his conductor, Stanley Kay. Stanley Kay was a empresario, maestro, composer, drummer, one of the best humans that ever, um, ever was in the music business. And he was uh, on many iconic, we'll call, call them pop acts of the, the of the 50s, like the Frankie Lane, a Mule Train, and I know he's the drummer on How Much Is That Doggy in the Window. He was a manager. He managed a lot of people in show business. He was also involved in many Broadway productions, and one of his most interesting jobs was being the manager and assistant drummer of the Buddy Rich Band. Took over in 1946 at the Sherman Hotel in Chicago, and he said the first thing that Buddy made him do was go out and fire a whole bunch of people in the band. <laughs> Nobody even knew who he was. But Stanley played drums with Buddy, with Buddy's band if Buddy didn't want to play. Because like if he wanted to sing or Buddy was a great tap dancer and sometimes they, the, the band played for different acts, like warm-up acts and Stanley would play drums. And anyway, I'm playing along and I was like, wow, these charts are great. They're so swinging and so fun, like you would imagine. After the concert was over, I made a point to talk to Stanley. I was like, you're the, you're the Mr. K that was with Buddy Rich and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yes. And we made a pact to stay in touch. Stanley K told me that he was, um, had been in these various aspects of show business, like Broadway, television, and he was just, he missed the band business. His roots were in the band business. So he just said, I, I wanted to get back in the jazz business and his favorite style was big band music. And he, he just, he, you know, I wanna do this, but I, there's so many big bands around. And he said, I never see any women playing this, playing this music or in any of these big bands. Very thankfully, he remembered that he saw me. That was his motivation. He goes, I want to do this, but I want to give a whole bunch of w women an opportunity to do this because I haven't seen it since the, the Sweethearts of Rhythm, which is a very famous all-woman band in the 1940s. June or May of 92, Stanley called me and he said, hey, do you know other women musicians that play like you? 
I, at first I was like, I hope that means good. <laughs> Coming from Buddy Rich's manager, oh, he thought I played good, wow, what a compliment. I was like, I do. And he wanted to start a big band. And it was as simple as that. And in June, we had an audition. Uh, myself, an amazing teacher, writer, educator, John LaBarbera, who was friends with Stanley from the Buddy Rich Band, and myself, we put word word out in every through every resource we could think of that, hey, this Stanley K is starting a new big band. He wants it to be women and who wants to audition. So 40 people came from all over the world. We picked the original 15, and, and that was in June of 92. And our first gig was in March of 1993. <laughs> audition he said if there's if I he had very high standards and that was the motivation for the original 15 members to be in the group still today and many times people uh, ask women to do things because they're like oh, oh uh, yeah you play okay but you know you know show some cleavage or put on a mini skirt or put on lipstick which is absurd <laughs> but believe me even today some of that still goes on he didn't care about anything except if you can play you can play I don't think there's any difference between a woman playing or a man playing. As I always said, uh, if you can play, you can play. If you can't play, you can't play. And we're going to form this band and all the music is going to be original, either original arrangements or originals. And the whole thing was just so exciting and coming for, from such a deep and serious place of, I just, I want to make some great hard swinging music and let's give people a chance who I, who I haven't seen in my lifetime having an opportunity to do this. And that was women. So that's, that was his motivation. When the Diva Jazz Orchestra did our, our first gig, which was happened to be at New York University, March 30th, 1993, all women playing jazz music or doing anything in a traditionally male dominated field never in a million years put their gender above their craft or what they're doing. No woman in jazz ever goes around thinking, oh, I'm a woman in jazz. <laughs> we are by default. It's always we're just in jazz. So you gotta be careful, we find out how you say it, but Sherry pointed it out to me. It's, it's a good band or a great band. So, but you, you, then you have to say, but they all happen to be women. Historically, it's been, there's been articles published in Downbeat, why women can't play jazz in the 1940s and all kinds of crazy reasons. <laughs> we got reviewed in the Midwest one time and the, the reviewer said, the last thing I wanted to do on Saturday was go see a bunch of girls play a watered down version of In the Mood. And then, boy, was I wrong. You know, so that, that people sometimes just, just because the band is women immediately brings all kinds of things to mind. I think it's a, it's better, much better today. And actually, there's an, just backtrack for a second, there's an amazing film called The Girls in the Band. That's the history of women jazz instrumentalists, and it asks a lot of women who are 100 right now about their experience in the Sweethearts of Rhythm and other, other performing experiences back in the 30s and 40s. Did you consider that you're working under a handicap to try to make a profession of being a jazz pianist as a woman? Well, it has never been a handicap scene, truly, and I really don't think about it. I just think of myself as a musician working with other musicians. And they say a lot of the same things that I could tell you today that still happens, which is remarkable, like the progress, it's, there is progress, but it's very slow. The progress today of having like a, the jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra having blind auditions is really important because people do listen with their eyes first. And if they see you, they'll have a different perception if they just listen to you play. It's 100% true for all of us. Me too, everybody. It's just a natural thing. All the music is, is I'm gonna use the term straight ahead, meaning it's deeply rooted in the tradition of of, of, of swing. And I don't, mean, I don't mean swing necessarily like a dance band swing, but I mean Count Basie and where Woody Herman or, or Buddy Rich might have been coming from. But even if it's an original tune, I want there to be a lot of melody. It can be reharmonized as, as bizarre as you would like, but I want people to I want people to snap their fingers and tap their feet and smile. The Diva Jazz Orchestra's music library is all original, it's either original arrangements of standards or, or original pieces of music. Starting with our, our newest CD is called 25th Anniversary Project, and all the music on there is original, and it was composed by me and nine of my bandmates. So it's amazing to have a band of 15 people where uh, 12 of them are ex extraordinary writers and arrangers. Some of the writers we've had, the great Tommy Newsom, and I mentioned John LaBarbera, the women in the band. This great writer in Los Angeles named Scott Whitfield, and Michael Abeni. Ellen Rowe, one of the best writers I know, just a lot of great composers. Whatever the Diva Jazz Orchestra is doing a performance, we certainly offer immediately any kind of outreach that the venue might suggest where we could do the most good. So sometimes that means bringing in several 
dozen, sometimes actually <laughs> sometimes hundreds and hundreds of school kids to do some general Q&A and talk back and demonstrations to pri private lessons, instrumental lessons, to lessons in improvisation and jazz history. One of the most fun things we like to do is, is group lessons. Like all the trombones go with uh, our trombone section and work on music together and, you know, instrument specific and, and style wise. A lot of things like telling kids like, this is how you make this swing. And that's kind of what it, our mission, keep the world swinging. The original members of D.Va are me and our lead trumpet, Lisa Whitaker. Many people have been in the band over 20 years. We have a very, very, uh, a lot of longevity, which is, um, really to me is remarkable. And people are very dedicated and love playing in the group. The opportunity to bring this music as, as, as women to Israel and all over Japan and all over Western Europe into South America and all the places we've been blessed to go and from the Hollywood Bowl to Carnegie Hall to, we just, we played at the NEA Jazz Masters Awards last year. We've done really, have had some amazing experiences and uh, just keep it, keep them going. And uh, you know what? Men play in the band too. It's on our website. It's everyone who's ever played in Diva. We try to keep track of it because gender never surpasses talent. Sherry, Sherry makes me proud. She, she's dedicated. She cares. She's the backbone of the band. She yeah. keeps it going. Her musicianship is superb. She's a fine arranger and a wonderful composer. And we're proud. The Diva Jazz Orchestra has been, it's been, for over half of my life, it's been like the center of, of what I've done musically. I love it, we're st I'm still doing it 27 years later. I congratulate them because without the product, mm. I could maneuver all day long, but without the product, I would have nothing. We got a good product, we got a great product.